a very good morning and welcome to the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library uh, on the occasion of a public lecture titled Making of an Archive, Journey Towards Exploring the SME's Past. We know that past is a contested territory, especially when identities and communities are involved past can become a highly contested category. There are certain regions of the world, there are certain parts of the world where the past is more contested than in other regions. One such part of India is Assam. We know that as of now this NRC controversy is going on in Assam. It is essentially about the Assamese past. It raises the question of who is an SMEs and who is not. So this is a contest about identity, community, about the SMEs past. Now, as I said that this contestation is an intrinsic part of history, but in the case of certain regions, it becomes all the more important and Assam is one such region. We know the connection between the creation of the past and the making of archives. Everywhere in the world, past has been constructed in the modern period primarily on the basis of archives. So archive building leads to the construction of the past and the construction of the past then also leads to further archive building. That is not to suggest that archives have not been built in the, in the pre-modern period. They have been. But in the modern period, this has become a highly systematic and organized activity, partly because communities, groups, regions, nations want to construct a past for themselves with the help of history, with the help of especially archives. And as I already said, that in the case of Assam, this is especially so because it's a highly contested region. It has been a contested region for quite some time. Um, I'm reminded of, uh, you know, looking at the topic of uh, Sudeshna's uh, lecture, I'm reminded of what uh, George Orwell said, who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present, controls the past. So it's essentially an exercise in wielding power. It's a contest for power at some end. So with these uh, few words, I would now invite uh, uh, Professor Sudeshna Purkayast to deliver her lecture on the topic uh, for about 40 minutes. Then we'll have uh, questions and answers. Thank you. And sorry, I uh, I very warmly welcome her, uh, you know, at the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library. Thank you. <coughs> Respected Mr. Chairperson, the Deputy Director of Nehru Memorial Museum and Library, Dr. Ravi Mishra. Respected audience and esteemed friends. Today, I feel it a proud privilege to be here. And first of all, I'd like to convey my thanks to Dr. Ravi Mishra, uh, who is a very good friend of mine, and for inviting me here and giving me such an excellent opportunity of sharing my views with this August gathering. Once again, thank you, Ravi, and your organization. Today, the topic is making of an archive, a journey towards exploring the Assamese past. The archive which I'm going to talk about is a regional archive of Assam which preserves 34,000 
589. This is the exact figure of records. And interestingly, all those records are Assamese indigenous records. Many of these were Tayahom. You all know that Assam was ruled for around 600 years by the Tayahoms. Ahom records and also a good number of Sanskrit records. Sorry, I'll just switch it off. And this archive is known as Narayani Handikoi Institute. It is located in Guwahati, but it is commonly known to the students and researchers of history as Department of Historical and Antiquarian Studies, DHAS. Sometimes we call it DHAS, DHAS. It's commonly known as DHAS. And it's rightly considered as the treasure trove of indigenous records of Assam. It's a, it's a fantastic place. You can't imagine. I'm not using this PowerPoint, but if I could, then I could have shown you the materials which are preserved there. Now, uh, what I'm going to talk about, I want to highlight today, uh, is the backdrop of making this archive, which is a long journey, a journey of 100 years, from 1829 to 1929. It was formally set up in 1929, but I started the journey from 1829 because that year, 1829, is a landmark in the history of history writing in Assam. Because the year witnessed the first printed history of Assam. It was the first printed history of Assam. So I took the period from 1829 to 1929 up to the formation of this archive. For my convenience, I have uh, divided this presentation into two parts. In the first part, I'll talk about the formation uh, of this archive, the process, the collection process, how uh, the records were collected from different quarters, and also the framing of a public life for Assam, and how the history itself took the shape of a popular character, not only academic, but a popular character also. And in the second part, I'll, I'd like to show the collaborative practices, that is, how the British bureaucratic circle became very much keen and interested in collecting, preserving the old records of Assam. In course of this uh, uh, observations and narration, there are some pertinent questions which came up in my mind, and there are broadly three questions which emerged, and in the concluding part of my uh, presentation, I'll try to reply to these questions, okay? So now let me start with the part one. One of the most significant aspects of an archive is to transform the documents into public records. In context of this, I can refer to a very old known articulation of a very old statesman, but he was a unique statesman, Thomas Jefferson. What he said about, long back, let us save what remains not by vaults and locks, which fence them from the public eye and use in consigning them to the waste of time, 
but by such a multiplication of copies as shall place them beyond the reach of accidents. Therefore, the term public remains the cornerstone of the making of an archive. It is to be noted in this context that Assam has a very long tradition of record keeping and also the tradition of writing narratives about the past in the form of Buranji literature. So this Buranji li literature is a unique genre of uh, sometimes it can be termed as historical literature also because it dealt with history in such a way if we go deep into the study of these manuscripts and transcripts of the Buranjis we find how this historical temporality was framed in their own way in these Buranji texts. So Assam had this tradition of record keeping and also this writing of history. The development of DHAS into a regional archive has a long history of collecting and preserving historical information from the places of their origin, this, these manuscripts, the manuscripts of the Buranji texts. What were their places of origin? Like the Ahom royal family. They started it much later when the Ahom kingdom was totally devastated, but they started to collect it from the Ahom royal family. The aristocratic families, old aristocratic noble families, American Baptist Mission, they possessed, they also started collecting, when they came to Assam, they started collecting those manuscripts from different quarters because it was at that time, in, from 1820 onwards, it was scattered like anything because of this Muamaria rebellion which took place in Assam in the 18th and early 19th century, which was like a civil war, which is termed by Amalindu Guha as a civil war. And during the Burmese invasion, because in Burmese invasion, many of the aristocratic families, they left Assam, they took shelter in Assam, and also this Burmese, when they plundered Assam, they plundered everything along with these manuscripts also. So it was scattered in different places of Assam and also in different parts of Burma also. Because many of the old aristocrats of Assam, Ahom particularly, they traveled as a companion, traveling companion, assistant of the British bureaucrats and went to Burma and collected many of such. One of such Buranji is called Lailik Buranjis. Lailik means great. So Lailik Buranjis. So in that way, it was started to be collected in a, from a different parts of Assam and Burma. Such journey of the historical information was marked with the abstraction of private documents, that is, manuscripts of the Puthis written in Assamese, Ahom, and Sanskrit language for making them public. In global context, the state and the market have historically acted as the abstracting forces, and this process found expression through two logics of abstraction, which has been articulated by the historian Dipesh Chakraborty in his writing, which was published in EPW, and also a part of his book, the recent book, Calling of History, really a wonderful book, The Calling of History, Sir Jodunath Sharkar and his Empire of Truth. So in there, he called it as reification and commodification. Though the abstracting mechanism of commodification could not take place in India because the market for ancient books and records which took place in Europe, which take place in Europe, but it could not take place in India, any part of colonial India. But reification was partially done in Assam through collecting of the manuscripts from private position through the vehicle of social networking and thereby establishing the preserving institute like DHAS. We have talked about the foundation of DHAS in 1929. Now we have to see 
what the American Baptist Mission did for this making of this archive. Assam came under colonial subjugation in 1826. And just 20 years later, the Assamese society underwent a major transformation with the introduction of vernacular print. The year 1846 saw the first Assamese newspaper, Orunodai, published by the American Baptist Mission. Since their early days, the American Baptist Mission started collecting a large number of puthis, which were collected in the Orunodai days and pre-Orunodai days by the missionaries. The names of such missionaries were Reverend Brown, Reverend Bronson, Reverend Barker, Reverend Carter. They had done a lot. They had collected and they were still collecting these and they started with the introduction of this print culture, they started to publish these manuscripts and serialized some of them in um, 50, 20 intervals. And these manuscripts were started to be published in the Orunodai. So Orunodai in that way played a very leading role in shaping a public life of Assam through the publication of these manuscripts because these are Assamese where they found the Assamese elites, the Assamese people they found that here we are here we are. You know uh, Assam was not included within the mainstream nationalist historiography of India. If you find the map there you would never find Assam in the map. So they found that yes and another cause was there in uh, after colonization uh, Bengali was made the official language in Assam. That also posed as a hindrance to the Assamese community to develop themselves their language because they had to go to the court and use Bangla. They had to go to the school to use Bangla. And so there was a resentment. So they found in this Buranji text which was a rare genre of historical writings and generally what the colonizers had taught us that India was ahistoric. You have everything, but you don't have history. Written history, we have taught. But here, they have found that, no, this is a reserve of our own knowledge of history in the Buranji text. So another thing is Buranjis. It's very interesting to find the Buranjis, that these are all written in prose pattern, not in poetic style. So prose pattern comes much later in Bengal, because... In early Bengali uh, manuscripts, everything was writing in, uh, written in a poetic form. If you go to Chorjapoto, that earliest one, you will find that it is all in a Harinabairi, Apani Mangse, Harinabairi. These are these were the old Bengali pattern of yours. No, they said, "Look, we had in the pre-colonial days, we had our prose style, prose, and it's really interesting to find the prose pattern if you go through the Puranjis. The, such a I think purified prose in its language, in its pattern of writing. This is really, really very interesting. So, uh, so what happened? This public life has started to be built up in this way. In 1925, a large number of manuscripts were discovered from the position of the American Baptist Mission. Interestingly, one such manuscript contained within itself the signature of a a uh, historical figure, Nidhi Levi Farwell, who was the first Assamese who was converted to Christianity. So his signature was also there. So these were all found in the Arunodai. So in 1850, a manuscript having the history of the Chutia kings, Chutias were a tribe, was published in Arunodai. Now we have seen what missionaries were doing. In a nutshell, we have seen, besides the missionaries and their mouthpiece Arunodai, a large number of self-taught historians had played a vital role in carrying forward the project of making the archive. From 1829 to 1929, well-organized research on scientific line on the history of Assam was carried forward by the researchers who did not belong to the category of professional historians. Rather, they belonged to different walks of life 
and the immature historians' contributions in collecting and preserving the indigenous records acted as precursor of shaping the archive like DHAS. Now I'd like to focus on those immature historians because generally in the history books, these names are not mentioned. The first uh, historian, he was also an immature one, Holly Ram who wrote in 1829 the first printed history of Assam. Ananda Ram Thekyal Fukan, Ganabhi Ram Borua, Hem Chandra Barua, Ananda Ram Barua, Kashinath Tamuli Fukan, Harakanta Sharma Barua, Indibar Barua, Ratneshwar Mahanta, Hem Chandra Gaswami, Lakshmi Nath Bez Barua, Padmanath Kohai Barua, Shonaram Chaudhuri, Hiteshwar Bar Barua, Sharat Chandra Gaswami, Khetradhar Puragohai, Kanak Lal Barua, Padmadhar Chaliha, Gauri Datta Mishra Vidyavushan, Benudhar Sharma, Divananda Bharali, Sharbeshwar Kakati, Tolan Chandra Saikya, Brahma Chandra Saikya, Nakul Chandra Saikya. There are others also, but I haven't included those names. So most of them were immature from different walks of life. Some were working in a library as a librarian, uh, newly grown up library. Some resided in village houses, belonged to the aristocratic family, but they were learned, they started. Some were lawyers. So from different walks of life, they started to write history and collect the, this records. To facilitate their historical research, the research association known as Kamarup Anusandhan Samiti was set up in 1912. These scholars were well, uh, all working on scientific line with original sources and rationalist thinking. Significantly, their efforts of historical research created a popular life of the history itself. Mm -hmm. Now, Dipesh Chakravarti, in his The Calling of History, he has shown how the history of India in the 19th century and also the early part of the 20th century, it had acquired a cloistered life and at the same time, in a parallel way, a popular life. So we cannot ignore the popular life of history. Even Ravindranath Tagore, we know him as our Gurudev, and he was also associated with this popular characterization of history. So, Akhoi Kumar Maitreya, they were the names in Bengal. So in Assam also, it's completely different because there are more and more Assamese people. The reason was different here, but they were also participating. Uh, the history of Assam in the 19th century was almost written by the immature scholars, and the debate over historical issues of Assam had molded the history of Assam in the informality of public life. The term informality of public life has been borrowed from the historian Shabbushachi Chakravarti, who has been referred to in uh, this um, Dipish Chakravarti's work, who has observed, Shabbushachi Bhattacharya has observed, that the site of modern Indian socio-economic and political thinking and contestation was not the university, but the public life. In Assam, the academic institution like universities emerged much, of, much later, only in 1946, while Cotton College was established much earlier in 1901, and therefore Cotton College played a significant role in pursuing historical research in Assam with the help of such professional historian like Surya Kumar Bhunya, who is regarded as a doyen of Assam history. He was a, completely a professional trained historian who did his research and history in, under uh, Professor Dodwell in the School of Oriental and African Studies, came and joined the Cotton College, and he was a trained historian, professional historian. There were others like Baddhanath Bhattacharya, though he was a Sanskrit scholar, then Dhiresh Acharya, he was also Mahamohapadhyay, he was also uh, Cotton College faculties. Interestingly, long before the establishment of academic institutions, these self-taught scholars pursued their debate on issues fundamental to the discipline of history and thereby shaped a popular life of the history of Assam. 
In Assam, collection of old records had developed another trend in debating historical issues in the formation of organization like Bongyo Shahita Nishaloni Shabha in Guwahati, where articles on original sources were regularly presented by the scholars, both professional and amateur. It was Paddunath Bhattacharya, a professor of Sanskrit in Cotton College, who took the initiative to present Assamese history and culture to the neighboring province of Bengal. Why he wanted, why he took the initiative? Because in Bengal, in the late 19th century also, there was a very obnoxious idea about Assam, which was popular in Bengal that Assam is a land of inhospitable terrain, Assam is full of jungle, forest, the, full of beasts, even the magic land. These things are very popular in Bengal because very people came, intruded into Assam. So, came, but the handful of Bengali people under company service, under colonial service. So that's why Pantanad Bhattacharya, being a Bengali, uh, he started to circulate this history in a form of stories to different parts of Bengal. Again, an amateur scholar, Gopal Krishna De, the librarian of Karzan Hall, which is now called Novin Chandra Bhattaloi Hall, introduced to Bengal the story of Jayamati. Jayamati is a very remarkable princess of Assam, and in the 19th and early 20th centuries, what happened in Assam to uh, intensify the nationalist ideas, this Jayamati became an icon of nation, Assamese nation, and different historians, different writers from public life also, they started to glorify Jayamati to focus, to uh, make her a nationalist idol, a nationalist icon. So this Jayamati story was circulated by this Gopal Krishna De to Bengal, different parts of Bengal through writing articles and writing poems also. So what happened? In Bengal at the time, there was a number of magazines and periodicals run by women, like Bharat Mohila was one of them. And in Bharat Mohila, this an article was written by Shatodal Bashini Bishash on Jayamati. So Jayamati has crossed the barrier of Assam. And now it is going to Bengal as a topic of writing article. Okay. Now in this way, uh, another uh, um, periodical, Anushandhan uh, Pakhik Potro, where there was an article written by an anonymous writer, and she was a woman, most probably. Uh, her, uh, the, uh, the caption was, Obolar Atmodan. Obolar Atmodan. Now, it was so popular for the time being, at the period, that Jayamati was made the center on Jayamati, a jatra, you know, in Bengal, there is a very traditional form, um, performing art form is called Jatra, no? So this Jatra was staged from Mothura, yeah, Natak, Natak, but Natak, it is prior to Natak, indigenous, it is rooted to the rural life of Bengal. It's quite different. It is not staged, but it is uh, performed in an open air. There is a conscience, Vivek, who came, who come with some songs and all this. So it is a div Natak, but it is a different indigenous form of Natak. We'll continue. Okay, okay, we will continue. Uh, so uh, this uh, Jatra was uh, staged by a company, Mathuranath Shah's company. He was quite popular company, Jatra company. So that Mathuranath Shah's company staged a jatra on Jayamati and Horibada Chattopadhyay, who was a jatra actor, quite popular at that time, he also played the role, a very important role in that jatra. So in this way, it became popular, this Assam history. It, it was started to be popular, not only in Assam, but also a reading public among the, and also some common people, this jatra and all these, uh, so common people of Bengal also. So it was a noble task on their part, no. Now I'm coming to the second part of my uh, presentation. Preserving old records in Assam was the outcome of a colossal scheme jointly collaborated by the British bureaucrats and the Assamese colonial elites, 
both professional and amateur historians. It is to be noted that the British bureaucrats played a vital role in preserving old historical records in Assam. John Peter Waite, a doctor who accompanied Captain Welsh while he came to Assam with his mission, took the initiative of collecting historical records from different parts of Assam and started compiling, a, compiling it into a history of Assam. In 1894, Lyle, the then officiating chief commissioner of Assam, pointed out that steps should be taken to arrest the destruction of Assamese historical manuscripts by collecting the Buranjis, making accurate copies, and translating them. In the same year, Edward Gate, he is still believed to be the author of the history of Assam, and it is still used as a textbook in colleges. Edward Gate submitted a scheme defining the scope of the work to be undertaken. In 1908, F. W. Sidmarsan, the first principal of Cotton College, wrote a brief monograph on Assamese language in which he proposed the necessity of employing a person having command in Sanskrit and Assamese language for collecting and preserving the old Assamese puthis. Colonel Pierre T. Gordon, the officiating commissioner of Assam, liked the proposal and Hem Chandra Goswami was considered to be the most suitable person for the job because of his command on Assamese, his tilt towards historical studies and his access to Satra Institution. Now, Satra Institution is also a very special uh, type of cultural organization in Assam which originated in, in the medieval period. It's basically the Vaishnavite institutions, cultural institutions where cultural practices are, are um, um, performed and also trained. The people are trained in Satrite culture. You know, Assam has also a classical form of dance and this is called Hatriyanritta. So this Hatriyanritta originated from this Satra institution. And they also had the tradition of record keeping. Huh? It is amazing that how old records during the time of Shankar Dev, Madhav Dev, Damodar, they were keeping the records in their own way. Hmm. So from this, but they didn't know the scientific method of keeping. keeping. So it was the prime effort of this Hem Chandra Goswami to intrude into this Satra institution and collect those uh, manuscripts. Interestingly, uh, in, uh, consequently, in 1912, Hemchandra Goswami was deputed on special duty to collect and preserve the Assamese puthis. Interestingly, in the same year, in 1912, Kamrup Anusandhan Samiti was set up with the object of preserving the antiquities of Assam and extending the study of Assamese history. The institution took the initiative in locating the archaeological sites of Assam and correct reading of different inscriptions. Meanwhile, Goswami, this Himchandra Goswami, had extensively traveled to the places in Brahmaputra Valley, Gwalpara, Kamrup, Nagaon, Sipsagar, Lakhimpur, Mangaldahi, and with the assistance of district administration, this is very important, this, with the, every time they were assisted by the district administration, British administration, and the local Mozadars, he, had, he was able to collect a large number of such puthis. Even from Koch Bihar, Goswami was able to collect uh, Assamese puthis from the Royal Archive and made catalog of 100 such puthis. Moreover, from Satra Institution, Goswami was able to collect a list of old Assamese manuscripts. Sometimes, under official instruction, puthis were either purchased or brought on loan. Thus, by 1912, the year in which Kamrup Anusandhan Samiti was set up, the total number of puthis collected by Hem Chandra Goswami was 1,334. In 1914, he was deputed again on special duty for six months again to complete the task of cataloging the old puthis. Consequently, this 
cataloging saw the light of the day in the name of the descriptive catalog of Assam manuscripts. In 1927, this was published by the Assam government with a preface written by Surya Kumar Bhunya. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So after two years, this archive was set up, uh, and it was in 1929 the department was established to carry forward the projects of Sir Charles Lyell and Edward Gate, and Surya Kumar Bhunya was made the first assistant director of the institute. And uh, just after joining the office, Bhunya had announced the policy to be followed, that is recovery, it is a quote, recovery and publication will be the guiding aim of the department, just what they had shown to the native Assamese. Now, in this way, the archive was formed, but besides these elites, there were some petty clerks, petty workers in the office, even some villagers also, they also played a role. Besides them, it was not possible to have this large number of transcript we use right now. So some of them were, I'd like to mention their name, Vasudev Mishra, Upendranath Sharma, Jivan Chandranath, Radhanath Hajarika, Dharmakanta Sharma, and Anandaram Gohai. And this pre-print phrase of the Buranjis was marked with the hazard hazardous task of collection and tra making transcript by these people. So up to this, it is over. But after that, I told you that in the concluding part, uh, I'll raise three questions, three broad questions. The first question is, is an archive only a preserving institution? Was it like that? So I can answer it. Uh, then only it will be a complete one. Uh, Generally, we think that archive is always a preserving, but recently, Jacques Derrida's work on archive, named Archive Fever, has influenced much of the archival discourse in, it, in the world. Derrida has proposed a psychoanalytic reading of the concept of the archive. Derrida claims that Freudian psychoanalysis offers us a theory of archive premised on two conflicting forces, one is a death drive and the other is a pleasure drive. Darida claims that Freud posited as a death drive, that is, primal urge towards aggression and destruction, can also be characterized as archive destroying. Now sometimes this archive destroying also takes place. Here is a very interesting story, I'll take some time from you, uh, that in the pre-colonial period in Assam, I told you that there was an constant writing of this, regular writing of these Buranjis and all. So in the 18th century, during the rule of the Ahom monarch Rajeshwar Singha, this one uh, minister, a very powerful minister, his name was Kirti Chandra Barbarua. So Kirti Chandra Barbarua found in a large number of Buranji texts which had questioned his ancestry, his Ahom ancestry, and also his aristocratic uh, social um, status. And sometimes uh, it was quite dubious also. So what he did, he induced the monarch to destroy the pages, those pages which were talking something against his ancestry. Jalambota, you were an imitation ahom. This term was used there, Jalambota. So these, these were destroyed. A large number of Buranjis were destroyed at that time. And what happened? This memory of burning the Buranjis by Kirti Chandra in the 18th century was shared in 1960s when uh, the entire Assam was in the grip of linguistic nationalism and ethnic violence, the language movement. So what happened? Just in 1960-61, this first printed history of Assam, which I'm, I uh, talked about, the manuscript of that was found by one Bengali intellectual, a famous person, Jyotindra Mohan Bhattacharya, who worked in the Bongya Shahitya Parishad in Bengal, and he found that this is the manuscript of that, and he 
edited the wonderful editing he had done and he published it. Just after the publishing of this uh, first printed history edited by Jatindra Bhavan Bhattacharya, what happened? There was a jerk in the Assamese intellectual society. A part of them, those who were chauvinists, extremely nationalists, they demanded that the state should interfere to ban the book or they are referring Kirti Chandra Barbarua that we had the tradition just to burn the pages, just to destroy those pages which were talking about the Ahoms in a different way which generally the Buranjis do because it was not a royal Buranji, it was a private Buranji, private writer had written. So he had written in a different, some epithets were used against these Ahoms. Sometimes he uh, tried to portray some uh, obscenity in describing different cults of Assam, which were practiced in Assam. So they said, no, we have the Buranjis, we had a tradition of having a very purified language. So the politics of purified language also came, and they wanted to just to erase this from. But there was a group of Assamese intellectuals who didn't want it. They said, no, history should be kept like that. Why? So in this way, sometimes archive can destroy also through the state, through the power and authority. So the second one, the second question is, uh, did new narratives emerge during the journey of archive making. Yes, of course, new narratives came out of this exploration journey, like history Buranji debate, and finally making the term Buranji synonymous to history. This was an example of nationalizing the Assamese past. The language-based cultural nationalism was shaped, which became the central place of Assamese historiography in the 19th and 20th century, and also the valley politics we find in this process. And number three, the last question is that, uh, what was the motive of the colonial state behind the, uh, their uh, supportive attitude in preserving the indigenous records in Assam? We can say it is right that the bewildering land patterns, uh, multiple land uh, patterns in the state, it prompted them to uh, intrude into the past of Assam and they wanted, but at the same time, I think it is also a part of this colonial project, the imagining of the empire, what Edward Said has shown, that uh, uh, this, uh, the core of the British administrative circle was based on the, this data and information collecting, particularly the knowledge producing institutions like the universities, like the archives, like the museum also. But it is not that ripe enough. I'm telling you, it's quite kacha still, and I have to do more research on this particular field, but I think it is also a part of that greater imagining of the empire. So that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sudeshna. Now we are open to questions and comments. Brief. Please introduce yourself. Ma'am, you talk. Ma'am, myself, Shivani Bajpe. I'm a senior fellow from the National Archives. Ma'am, uh, you talked about, like, uh, you raised a question that, like, is an archive only a preserving institution? So uh, I would comment at the same time I would want to ask something. So like uh, Theodore Schellenberg, the famous American archivist, he says that, you know, there are a dual objective of an archivist, which is not only, you know, to preserve record, one is to preserve, and the second one is to make the records accessible. So ma'am, what was being done to make these records accessible, or were they meant only for the administration? One, this, one. and... Yeah. Also, ma'am, the second question, you uh, talked about the destruction of records, right? So, ma'am, do, do you see it as an archival silence or as a gap in history? Yeah. Yeah. We'll take, uh, one Achha. Achha. Okay, okay, okay. Yes, yes please. Good afternoon, ma'am. I'm Shravani. I'm a student from IGNO. So, uh, I just wanted to ask, 
see, we have seen in the colonial history, the historiography uh, mainly supported by Didi Kosambi and Romila Thapar and Shushobun Sharkar and uh, Sumit Sharkar. Mm -hmm. So as you were uh, discussing your presentation, you were uh, telling us the amateur uh, history writers. So according to you, who are the real historians or historiography support uh, okay. so that we can learn something uh, okay. from them? Okay. On Assamese history month. This is a very interesting question yeah. if I may intervene. The distinction between yeah. amateurs yeah. and real yes. historians. And the real historiography you know. uh, support. Which we we would like to have yeah. your comments. Okay. 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 So, uh, so you have mentioned about like the history writing of these uh, amateur historians, and who who highlighted the popular uh, site, popular culture of uh, Assamese history. Mm -hmm. You can say that. So, ma'am, can we find any differentiations between their narrations and the narrations? maybe which made afterwards by the colonial bureaucracy or the colonial officials, or we, do we have any? So do we find any differentiation? Yes. Uh, let me start with her question. That is, um, you were uh, talking about this uh, access, no? Access to, uh, access of history, yeah. Look, uh, it was in the colonial India, and starting from colonial India, this access to historical information by the common researchers was very, very, very difficult. Because many of the files, many of the documents, these were not presented to the researchers. But after independence, we have seen that we can see budding a few, budding a few, like uh, this cartography of the Northeast. We cannot see it. Even I wanted it very much, but I couldn't see it. Look, there are some reasons behind it. We have, yeah, we are academics, we are thinking about, but uh, you say that silence, archival silence, if it is open to the researchers, if the accession to historical information is made, then what would happen? Uh, I think the proper history would be written. So from that point of view, I always prefer the accession, public access, public access to the records in the, in the archives. And this silence gap, we cannot welcome this in history. We cannot. And your uh, is, yeah, that professional and immature. Okay. Okay. Look, if we look at the history of history writing in India, the entire, not only in Bengal, in Maharashtra also, there's a large number of this, uh, the Baman, the Poddar, and all the. Huh, they were all immature. They were not trained in that modern historiography. No. But, Look, both sides are important because history is a discipline which need not, uh, I think, which doesn't require uh, that type of technique which economics or um, this uh, sociology, these ones. But history is a discipline uh, which is quite free. Everyone can have the access to history. So let them do their research. Let them do their research. If it is scientific, if it is good enough, if it is dependent on, if it is uh, based on the records, not only in records, interviews, different. Hmm. But the historian should be very cautious about that. The role of historian is very important in this regard. Okay. If I may add to uh, me partly address the question that you have raised about the distinction between amateur and professional historians. I would say that this is a fairly modern distinction, actually. She said that uh, all over India, actually, in, in Maharashtra as well, history was written by amateurs. I would say not just India, but across the world, actually. Until the beginning of the 20th century, much of the history was written by people who would today be described as amateurs. And <clears throat> The reason is not simply that history is a more accessible discipline, you know, as she says. Of course, it is partly true. History is not as technical as many other disciplines. 
But the fact is that these modern divisions of knowledge are fairly recent. The emergence of different disciplines, history, economics, sociology, psychology, all this happened in the second half of the 19th century. So till that time, the boundaries of knowledge, the frontiers of knowledge were very, very fuzzy and open to people. What we call interdisciplinary now is a conscious effort that you belong to one discipline and you try to reach out to another. But till the 19th century, every scholar was interdisciplinary by default. The question of over-specialization did not arise then. So this is one reason that the distinction between amateur historians and the professional historians in the context of the 19th century Assam, I think it does not uh, stand yeah. ground. This is one. Second reason, again, is very, very important as far as uh, history writing or archive making is uh, concerned. And there again, the distinction is, uh, you know, problematic. The reason being, and there, you know, the fact that India was a colonized country comes into existence. Mm -hmm. She talks about the British official discourse on the archives, and Shivani has raised the question of, uh, you know, this uh, archival silence, silence. and uh, inaccessibility, etc., etc. Related to this is the question of why the British were ultimately building the archives. They were trying to reconstruct the past of India in order to create a certain kind of colonial and imperialist discourse. This is not to say that this was their only intention, but obviously if you are ruling over a certain territory, you have to reconstruct and construct its past and incorporate it within the larger imperial narrative. So that is what they were trying to do. We see that by doing that, they were claiming that India had a certain kind of history or that it had no history. In fact, this was their dominant yeah, yeah. discourse that India had no history, yeah. India had no tradition of record keeping, which is refuted, refuted by the meticulous record keeping that we find in most parts of India in different forms. Like she has shown in the case of Assam, you find it in the case of Uttar Pradesh, you find it in the case of Bihar, you find it in the case of virtually all regions of India where the state was important or the intermediary groups were important, zamindars maintained records, you know, that the officials made records, the nobles kept records, uh, even uh, large businessmen, they kept records. Yeah. Quite often, we have access mm. to them. So record keeping has a long and rich tradition in India. Maybe, you know, not as rich as that in Europe. I might uh, concede that. But certainly, it was a very important tradition. But when the colonial discourse denied this and said that you Indians have no uh, past, you have no record keeping, the nationalists obviously had to contest it. Yes. So therefore... Ipso facto, most of the people who contested this by, uh, you know, digging out the records or by contributing to the archives, etc., had to be people who were amateurs. Because, first of all, you did not have too many professional historians to, even those, uh, you know, who were there would be less concerned about this as compared to people who had that uh, nationalist awakening who would try to challenge the colonial narrative. So my argument is that it is very substantially because of this, that all over India, most people who contested the imperialist discourse on uh, Indian history, they were amateurs. They continue, in fact, it's only after independence that the distinction became very, very clear. Today, of course, it's very clear. So maybe I have taken too much time. I think this is a decision that should be left to yeah, every individual, yeah, yeah. not for me to... Just like the name says Lady Koshambi or Romila Kapoor... Yes, they should be. They, they have done authentic works on the subject. On the subject, on your budget, who, who are the origin of authentic who are the stories? That's what I'm asking. On economic history, I think it is Lady Koshambi. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Economic history. Economic history. Very nice one. Yes. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for your fascinating talk. Uh, I wanted to actually say, um, ask actually that, um, you know, this whole process of recording, making, and representing history has been done by men, like, you know, mm -hmm. so in most part of the world, if not all. 
but also on the other hand there were like women have been present in history for example joy moti or konaklata or mulaga yeah and, and they were treated as symbols of the nation, nation. you know even oh. this whole article on um, joy moti obola atmodan yes. obola is someone who is like a victim Wait. who doesn't have an agency you know so um, I wanted to ask you if you actually can trace a trajectory of a feminist history of Assam or maybe, um, you know, would you say that there has been a feminist history of Assam? I would like to ask that. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, look, feminist history of Assam, if it is properly written, it will be a wonderful, fascinating one. Because in most of the social movements you will find in Assam, Mula Gabharu, from 1979 onwards, Mula Gabharu was used as an icon in their slogans also. But who were making the slogans? Men. Men were making the slogans. This Jaimati. Jaimati, you'll find in the nationalist discourse, Jaimati's sacrifice. Jaimati has been uh, conceptualized as Virangana, huh? Matri. Matri Rupini. So these are the ways. But if you read the, uh, those uh, folk uh, uh, this ballads, folk ballads, which is very popular in Upper Assam at one time, you will find there Jayamati's body and its suffering was the only theme of their uh, poems. So I think these things can be used as a very good material for the history of, uh, and the phallocentrism, how phallocentrism also uh, worked in the writing uh, about this Mullah Gabharu. There's a very old publication called Ahomordin, not that Hiteshwar Barbaru was Ahomordin. It was done, uh, written in 1920 when Surya Kumar Bhunya was a boy. School, uh, he was um, studying in school, I think. He was writing like a story. And there you will find that Mulaga Bharu was uh, depicted as a man. Sometimes she was projected as Chandi, Chamunda, all this. But her, everything, he was, she was riding on a horse. She was, everything was like a man. Hmm. She was brandishing the sword like a man, all this. So this type of phallocentrism also worked in the writing. So this would be a very good one. Mulaga Garama Kauri. Garama Kauri was one of the thing, one of the characters. Hmm. Ramani Gabharu. Huh, how this good women, bad women, these ideas in the nationalist discourse came up and interpretation of these women characters. So, so, uh, okay, so are you saying that such a history has not been yet written? No, uh, no, such a history, but some attempts were made. Mm -hmm. Some attempts were made, I think Jaita Sharma has done, a little bit she has done in, in the Heroes of Our Time, that Lachit Varfukan and Jaimati, she wrote about that. So. Yeah. Um, Any other question? Yes, Rajkumar, come, use the mic. Yeah, hello, ma'am. Thank you for your beautiful lecture. So, uh, my question, it is not exactly a question. It is, a, I just wanted to know, it's a query, that uh, when you use the term journey towards exploring the Assamese past, so, why is... Uh, this term being used as Assam is past and why not say towards knowing a region so I just knowing want to, a region yeah so it could be like because the past that we are trying to access it, it is not necessary that it would guarantee us a particular identity or a or it would lead us to a particular community it would be very diverse in its nature so was there an intended objective behind the building of an archive that it was to it was meant for so called uh, exploring the assamese past or so yes. that is what i wanted to yes, know yes that yeah. was there that was there very much there and i have told you know because assam was marginalized we have to admit it and acknowledge it that assam was marginalized in the nationalist historiography in our mainstream historiography and for that this and mapping a region when we call region this northeast and all this this is really very confusing for a student of history because it is so multi-layered 
and it is so diverse that you cannot say region because in Brahmaputra Valley also, here I am just talking about Brahmaputra Valley of Assam. Only the Assam is speaking. Assam is speaking, Assam is community. And there was a trend in the 19th century to focus on this community, how this community was framed in modern times. Okay? So that is the reason this Assamese nationalism, language-based nationalism, is the, I think it is the cornerstone of the entire historiography. The entire historiography was uh, guided. This is the guiding force of this Assamese nationalism. So it is a parallel nationalism. They did not, uh, they Time and again they were talking about Indian nationalism, but at the same time culture, a stream of cultural nationalism. We can, we can term it as a cultural nationalism. As a parallel way um, it was functioning. Just yes, a moment. Uh, one might add, uh, you know, here that in all parts of India nationalism developed either coterminously with uh, what is now described as regionalism, but what is probably a better to be described as subnationalism. In all parts of India, these identities emerged in this manner. So it is not very surprising that in Assam also it happened. Maybe it happened later because Assam was a relatively mm. uh, remote and marginalized region. But the fact is that the very evolution of India as a nation state is very different from uh, that of many other nation states. However, I might cite uh, to you some parallels from Europe. In the case of uh, Germany, for instance, there were many uh, uh, kingdoms and there were many states that merged into, and they, had, they merged into Germany in the late 19th century, and they had their own uh, separate identities. So it's only gradually that people learned to be Germans, not just ethnically, but also in terms of belonging to the, uh, you know, uh, uh, German nation state. So this process happened in this manner in India, and I'm not surprised that in Assam, what you want to say, of course, is very, very important because you are trying to say, you are trying to question the idea that it was yeah. an Assamese, Assamese past. past. You rather, uh, you know, uh, want to be uh, want it to be considered as a more general sort of past, and you want to take away that uh, yeah. Assamese thing, which of course is a uh, you know open question, but. Uh, I think, you know, all this should be kept in mind. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and uh, excellent uh, proposition you have given about the Assamese. But my uh, question is that are you talking about uh, some part of centuries where we look Assam as a leftover state? Because when we find, if we go to EPIC, you find all you know, uh, the epic uh, Maharani's came from Assam side, the Sita and then, you know, Rukmani. And then the uh, entire, uh, you know, business was rooted through this Assam and uh, the colonials were very eager to find out what is in Assam or in that area eventually, which created a lot of business in that area. So uh, I don't attribute the entire... Uh, subject of your that Assam was left over. It may be have left over for certain reasons uh, for some centuries, not, not in totality. Yeah. Uh, it was a part of uh, our nationhood because when we derive the epics from, you know, that area, even uh, the Sita was more or less from the, you know, or Rukmani. So I, I uh, attribute uh, that uh, whatever you're saying, that we left, because uh, it was a very big, uh, you know, uh, India is not a, a nation, it is uh, sometimes called a continent, subcontinent or something like that. And to rule, we have to have a better navigation, communication. So now we are at the crossroads, so now we feel that uh, we are left over. So anything you would like Thank to say on this? Thank you. Sorry. See, the question that you raise about, uh, the point that you make about uh, the epics mentioning the princes from uh, Assam or Manipur, etc., uh, the pertinent thing here to remember is that this is not a part of the original plot of the epic. 
these are the things that were later interpolated into the epics in order to claim legitimacy. So you find that in all parts of India, kings, princes, etc., dynasties have claimed that our ancestors fought in the battle of Mahabharat. It is obviously impossible for all of them to have fought in the battle of Mahabharat. This is not a part of, this is not a part of the original narrative of the Mahabharat. But because Mahabharat became a civilizational narrative of India, people from different regions claim. And you know, Krishna is supposed to have married so many princesses, and Arjun is supposed to have married so many. So this is a way of sort of making yourself a part of that civilizational narrative. So you find Chitra. If you look at the timeline of these marriages, again it does not work out at all. So Arjun is supposed to have been during the you know, period, brief period, when Yudhishthir was the king of Indraprasth and Rasui was taking place, he has gone, he has married several princesses. It's just impossible. You know, he goes to the Naglok, he marries one princess there, then he goes to, all the way to Manipur. And he marries Chitrangada there and they have children also, you know, all this cannot work out at all. So, historians certainly don't accept this. It is taken as an evidence of, and I'm not critiquing it as such. I'm saying that this is a part of how civilizational narratives arise. When the narrative becomes important, everybody wants to say that you, you know, I was a part of it or my ancestors were a part of it. It's a way of deriving legitimacy and nothing more than that. Pardon? If you live for somebody for six months, it doesn't become a wedlock for a lifetime. So he could have stayed for six months. No, but timeline does not work. This is what I am telling you. No, the, the timeline itself does not work. And look at the distances, you know. Uh, so when the Mahabharata was fought, uh, Krishna was 83 years old. So do you agree that? So then if you don't agree that, we have to... These are, of course, uh, not the things that historians would accept. Uh, these are the things that are again, you know, there in the popular uh, memory. People think of many things about, I'm no, uh, you know, I'm nobody to contest this, you know. In popular belief, there are many things about Ram, Krishna, etc., etc. That et is why they say uh, Lord Krishna is in three forms. So, uh, when a person lives for 85 years, so he would have different, uh, you know, uh, life to live with. So, but then uh, it becomes automatically, say, no, the reason I don't accept that Krishna was 85 at the time of Mahabharata, I mean, I'm just using my common sense. Krishna lived many more years after the war of Mahabharata also. He did many years. things in Dwarka. He died 120 years. So 120 years is not a probable, uh, you know, uh, uh, length of life and that is why we don't accept it. It's not impossible, of course, but it is not a probable one. Some people do. So I'm, I'm saying that it's not impossible, but it is improbable. That's it. Thank you, sir. Right. Because in uh, only few exceptional cases comes in the Guinness Book of Records. Yes. It's not a standard. Not it's a not standard. a standard. But if you say that somebody lived 80 years or 90 years, that of course is quite likely. In our family, we live for 95 years. For your explanation. <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> See, the, the, the point that I'm trying to make is the, the larger point that I'm trying to make is that epics, Purans, etc. provide excellent material for historians, but it requires a certain uh, historical methodology before you can cull out uh, information from these sources and use it for professional history writing. At the same time, there is a popular understanding and popular memory of uh, the past, which I am not contesting. I am saying that there are the, these are two different domains, you know. What people believe about Mahabharata, Ramayana, Krishna, Ram, Sita is one thing. But what historians uh, deduce from the epics and Purans and from other literature is quite another. Sometimes they agree with each other, but most often they not. And there is nothing wrong with this. You know, they can coexist. This is my point. So, is there any other question? All right then. Uh, we have had a very, very uh, fascinating uh, lecture and a very interesting discussion on, uh, I would say, uh, a very important subject, exploring the SME's past. I'm uh, 
very very thankful to my friend uh, sudeshna for uh, having agreed uh, for this invitation uh, and uh, she has delivered uh, such a fascinating lecture on the subject i am also very thankful to uh, all members of the audience uh, there are many people from nehru memorial uh, itself i uh, thank them all for their participation and i think we have had tea before the program isn't it we haven't had okay so tea is waiting outside then for us i'm sorry